Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, and great to see your shining, smiling faces here today. We're so glad that each one of you has joined us to worship our Heavenly Father today in this place at this time. Um, Marion Mills has told me that she has two large print quarterlies for this next quarter available. So first come, first serve. If you need a large print quarterly, um, please see her. Today's offering is for the UCC Advance, and the offering receptacle is there and back in the back. So have a wonderful Sabbath day. guys sound wonderful this morning. So when I was picking songs, I was thinking of all the ones that I've missed singing with my church family. So we're doing a lot of retro music this morning. So number 487, In the Garden. Number 487, and we'll sing all three verses. the voice 
and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he You guys sound really good. So <laughs> that's true. So we'll sing number 338, Redeemed. And I think this is the newer version of Redeemed, and I just love it so much. And we'll sing all three verses of Redeemed, number 338. Redeemed. Child and for 
It's now time for children's story, and young Sean McMurphy is going to be sharing a story with us this morning. And I will get the schoolhouse for offerings. It's okay, we'll go a cappella. Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. Sure enough. <laughs> All right, everybody, today I'm going to be telling the children's story, so I'm sorry about that, but <laughs> I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. All right. Recently, I discovered a strange phenomena that I would like to share with you all, and that phenomena is there's a surprisingly large amount of similarities between Bibles and cats. Oh, well, Exactly. Well, first of all, one of the things you might notice about the Bible, they don't really do much. You mostly find them just laying around the house. You know, cats will catch mice. The only thing Bibles tend to catch is dust. And when they catch dust, if they catch enough of it, you can actually watch your parents start to pet them. If you flicker through the pages fast enough, you can actually get it to purr. There's actually more. There's actually more similarities. But first, I'm going to have to catch you up on a tale. It's a very old story. Have any of you ever heard the story of Puss in Boots? Anyone? Really? Oh, very nice. All right. I'm dealing with some cultured kids up here. All right. All right. So I'm going to try to run it by you as fast as I can. All right. Once upon a time in a kingdom far, far away, as many of these stories tend to go, there was once three brothers. And when their father passed away, bless his soul, he left them all that he had. The oldest brother, being the oldest, got the most. He got the mill, you know, the money maker. The second oldest got the donkey, the one which turned the mill. But sadly, the third one, taking all that was left, knowing the story's called Puss in Boots, what do you guys think he got? He got, he got the cat. He didn't even get the boots. <laughs> all right, and so he sat and he you know, felt sorry for himself because his brothers got all the money making uh, properties. So he was just like, you can't even do anything with a cat can't even eat him. I would have preferred a pig, but, and the cat stands up, walks over to him, and tells him, excuse me, sir, but I'll have you know, I am much more valuable than a mill, and I am far more valuable than a stubborn old mule. The man wasn't too surprised for this, because it wasn't that uncommon for cats to talk back in that day. <laughs> um, and so the cat told him, I'll tell you what, he goes, if you go get your own, and this is what little he had left, your finest hat, and your finest pair of boots, and let me wear them, I will prove to you that I'm worth way more than what your brother's got man stopping and thinking about it for a while. I mean, I guess he did have something to lose because it was his nicest hat, his nicest pair of boots, but he said, you know what? Why not? And so he gussied him up and he sent him off. And here's what, uh, of course, Puss in Boots, here's what he did. He went into the forest and every single day, as cats are known to do, he caught a rabbit. And he actually would pick it up and take it into the kingdom and present it to the king himself. Now, a rabbit isn't particularly a very impressive gift, as you can imagine, but Puss in Boots did this every single day for months on end until the king was actually pretty touch with the consistency, and he says, excuse me, Puss in Boots, who's sending all this? And Puss in Boots, tipping his hat, stopped and said, my master, the Duke of Marquis, he's a very rich man, very handsome too, and goes, and every single day he sends me off to send you one of his many, many rabbits. And so the king goes, oh man, a, a duke? 
And he's been sending me these gifts all days. I haven't even had him over to dinner. So here's what we're going to do. He goes, we got to go meet this guy because I have a daughter, which I'm looking to you know, get her a husband, and the Duke of Marquis sounds just amazing enough. And so Push in Boots goes, all right, I'll see this house. So they get everyone the royal family. They get in the carriage and start riding out uh, to where Puss in Boots leaves him. But halfway through the thing, he jumps out of the carriage and runs on ahead, goes to his master and says, master, master, Right now, really quickly, I need you to take off all your clothes, throw them away, jump in the river, and pretend like you're going to drown. This was quite alarming to his master's ear because he couldn't swim. <laughs> and Puss in Boots goes, don't worry, sir, that actually works a lot better. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, gingerly, he took his clothes off, got up to the edge, one, two, and Push says three, and pushes him in. And then at the same time as he act he's actually drowning because he cannot swim, uh, Puss in the royal carriage comes by and Puss in Boots runs up to him and goes, Oh, your majesty, a terrible, terrible occurrence has happened. My master, the crown dudes of Marquis, he's been beaten, stolen, and he's thrown into the river and he's going to drown. The prince king goes, Outrage, outrage, I say, royal guards, you must save that grand man. And so they go in and they pull him out and goes, What kind of clothes were you wearing? Puss begins to cry. He goes, Oh, sir, they were the finest, the finest. It was a 100% uh, Egyptian cotton, completely irreplaceable, sir, truly. And goes, well, I don't have that on me, but the least I can do is give him a pair of my clothes. So just like that, the crown dukes of Marquis was now wearing the clothes of a royal. Puss in Boots tells him to get in the, the carriage where he meets the beautiful princess, and he's actually starting to get a little, hey, this, this might not be so bad. And the king tells him, we're actually on our way to your castle right now. Of course, the... Crown Duke and Marquis resumes the Puss in Boots and goes, what does he mean castle? And he goes, just wait. Puss in Boots hops out again, keeps running on further ahead until he comes across a bunch of peasants. Now these peasants and these farmers, they didn't have a master. They were so far out um, in the forest, but uh, they knew about the king and they knew he was powerful. So Puss in Boots ran up to each one. He goes, listen to me. He goes, the king, believe it or not, you're never going to believe this, the king himself is riding out in a carriage and he wants to test you know, how loyal you guys are and whether or not you can listen to him. See if you're worthy of his wrath, why don't they? And they're like, what are you talking about? Because here's what you do. Now I'm telling you, I'm only telling you this because the king told me to tell you. He says that he's going to ride by in a carriage and he's going to ask, write this down, who is your master? And you are ordered to say, the Duke of Marquis. And if you don't, you're probably going to get in a lot of trouble. And of course, they didn't believe him at first, as you get all up the same on the head. But eventually, the carriage actually showed up and he's presents like, oh, wait, wait a minute, what did he say? The Duke of Marquis. Uh, Martinelli, uh, Marquis, Marquis, that's the one. And sure enough, when the prince asked, I mean, the king, he's like, who's your guys' master? Because he really didn't know. They said, oh, we know, it is, is the Duke of Marquis. Big sigh of relief and goes, man, this guy has a lot of people in his kingdom. And when they looked over the horizon, they could see the castle, for there was a castle. It was large and immaculate. It was beautiful, actually. But one little problem, there was an ogre that lived inside. He was about as big and strong as a gorilla, and he had the ability to turn into any animal that he wanted to. So Puss in Boots, since he ran on ahead, knocked on the door. When the guy opened it up and goes, oh, who are you? What do you want? And I'm going to decide whether or not I'm going to have you for dinner. He carried a bell club. And Puss in Boots goes, oh, mighty ogre, I don't want to take up too much of your time. But you see, I had to come here because I had to settle a bet. He goes, a bet? What kind of bet? And goes, whether, how quick, whether or not you could escape me, whether or not you could defeat me. And goes, oh, no, no, no. See, I was with some of my alley cat friends, and we were talking about how you can turn into any animal. Is that correct? And he goes, of course I can. That is simple. I can turn into uh, giraffes, elephants, hippopotamuses, anything. And he goes, we already knew that. But we were talking about really amazing people who do really, really big things. They can only do big things. They can't really do small things. So much like you, you can turn into big things, but you can't turn into small things. It's just the way the world works. The ogre, being a little bit offended, he goes, no, I can turn into anything, any animal, no matter how small. Name one. He goes, well, I don't want to come, sort of coming out of the blue, but can you turn into a mouse just so I can win my bet? And he goes, yes. In fact, I'll turn into the smallest, most teensy, tiniest little church mouse you've ever seen in your life, and you will know that I am capable of anything. So he serves up. He goes down. <whistles> the mouse and goes, what do you think of that? And Puss in Boots goes, no. Oh. <laughs> Turns around, and as the king pulls up, he goes, my liege, your castle. Sure enough, uh, the Duke of Marquis goes in there, and the prince, go the king goes, this place is amazing. He's got hundreds of servants. He wears Egyptian fine cotton. And he's got this amazing castle. Please marry my daughter. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so he got married, 
and he lived a happily life in his large castle, and the last words of the story go, Puss in Boots walks up to him, him and says, See, Master, didn't I tell you I was worth far more than a dusty old mill and a stubborn old mule? That's the story of Puss in Boots. But going back in line with our theme, of how cats are so similar to the Bible, <laughs> uh, first of all, um, when it comes at the very beginning of the story, you know what he had to do in order to get Puss in Boots to go to work? What was the first thing he asked for? His boots and his hat. It was the finest thing that the guy had in his nicest position. Much like the Bible, if you want to get some work out of it, you must adorn it with your most valuable possession. Does anyone know what that is? The right answer. It's your time. Your time is your most valuable possession, but you're not going to get anything out of this book unless you adorn it with such. Second thing, how was it that the king, I mean, how, that Puss in Boots impressed the king? All I did is bring up rabbit. Every day, he'd see. That is what turned the meager presence of just a rabbit into something which could impress even a monarch. So consistency. So not just address it with your time, but consistency is what really polishes the gem of what it will give you. And um, also, uh, when Puss in Boots came out to his master where he was by the river, he asked him to take off all his clothes, jump in the river, and pretend, not pretend he was going to drown. I can right now, if you're going to read that book, or have it read to you, or any way you want, there's going to come times it's not always going to make sense. I am, I'm not old, but I'm old enough to know that I've encountered that many a times where things are just not going to make sense. You're going to have to believe that there are answers even when things are like they make sense. So I don't think. And finally, if you were to follow all of these things, I don't have to promise you, for there's already other promises stating such, that if you were to do all these things, much like a cat, this book can give you a kingdom, and it can establish you as a royal in a world far richer than any monarch you've ever seen in this. And that's our children's story. Good morning. It's time for us to pray. And in uh, the Bible, in Mark 11, there's a place where it talks about praying and forgiving. In fact, in some versions it says, as you stand to pray, forgive. Forgive those that have done something against you. And I was thinking about that, and then, of course, there's that real scary part where it says you'll be uh, forgiven as you forgive. And I was thinking about that today. Is there something that we need to forgive? Is there someone we need to forgive? Is that separating us somehow from a reality that God has for us? I don't know for you, but I know for me, there is forgiveness needed. Probably more people to forgive me than me to forgive them. So as we kneel to pray today, I want you to think about forgiveness because you've been forgiven. You're here. God has forgiven you everything. When he sent his son to a cross, he forgave you. His son said what? Forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. So shouldn't we? Let's kneel. Father, today we come on bended knee, asking and thanking you already for the forgiveness you've already given us. You've forgiven us our past, you've forgiven us our present, and you will forgive our future. So Lord, we just praise your name for being a merciful God. May we that have experienced mercy be able to give that to someone else. 
Lord, through your grace and mercy, through the power of your spirit inside of us, may we see others as you see them, as treasured possessions, as royalty, as someone worth our lives. Lord, today I know in this group there are those that struggle. They struggle in many ways. So, Lord, today we lift them up. Those around the world that are watching, they struggle. They may be facing persecution right now. They may not be setting in an air-conditioned setting. So, Lord, today we lift them up to you. May their witness go forward as the witness of your son. Lord, today, as a pastor speaks, may your words proceed out of his mouth. Today, because your spirit lives inside of us, may we accomplish something of eternal value, whatever that may be, whatever you have for us this day. Lord, today, most of all, though, we just want to praise your name for being who you are, for being merciful to us, to being a grace-giving God, not one that sets in vengeance. So, Lord, today... Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Time for scripture. Today's scripture comes from John 1. Not 1 John, but John, the first chapter. We'll be reading verses 43 through 46. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth's? So as we prepare ourselves for the sermon today, we're going to sing just the chorus of Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus together. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Pendleton Adventist Church. Oh, that's beautiful. Don't you just love to hear the sounds of other people's voices right here in the sanctuary of God? Friends, each week as we come together here in the church, we not only have all of you sitting with us today in person, right here in the Pendleton Adventist Church, but we also have many joining us on the live stream. So I just want to say hello to everyone on the live stream. Friends, if you open your bulletin, you'll notice that your pastor, me, Pastor Farr, Stephen, 
is very excited to ask you to help me share the gospel with people all over the world. Yes, friends, it says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the world as a witness to all of the nations. And then what's going to happen? That Jesus will come. Now, when you say the end will come, don't sound so sad. Because I don't know about you, um, but, well, actually, I do happen to know about you. I happen to know that over the last couple of years, we have all been going through quite the ordeal. Is that true? Can anyone here today relate to the fact that the last couple of years of life has been a little bit discouraging? At times unbearable. Yes, friends, over the last couple of years, we've been going through all kinds of craziness in this world, but you know what? Through it all, I see something happening. You know, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is Genesis chapter 50, and in verse 20 it says, You meant all of this for evil, but God allowed it to bring about circumstances that would what? That would lead to the thousands and thousands of salvations that would come from those circumstances. Okay, that is a little bit of a paraphrase, friends. Look it up in your Bibles for yourself. Genesis 50 verse 20 says that the trials that happen in this life, from the story of Joseph, we can see that the trials that happen in our life, that the things that we go through that try us and test us are allowed by God to bring about circumstances to put us into a position, to stick us into a place where God can lift us up make us a light to the world, and bring salvation to countless of thousands of people around the world. So here's how you can help me with this. If you go into your bulletins, if you have a bulletin, if you don't have one yet, please get one on the way out because there is all sorts of exciting events coming. Not only do we have a 40 days of prayer event coming, not only do we have a women's ministry event, but we also have several youth events coming up in which we are going to have a lot of fun and even take a trip to Tri-Cities. We might be able to talk all of the parents into some ice cream and some mini golf. Yes, ice cream and mini golf. Amen. <laughs> the parents are now looking at me with a look of like, we love you, Pastor Farr, but your time here is short if you start promising a bunch of things. Okay. All right. I like to play just as much as all of you do. I'm probably the biggest kid here. And so don't worry. There is going to be no shortage of fun events for us to all do together. But what I would like to talk to you about this morning is this. It's that I don't want to be the pastor in this church if I'm only going to preach to the people sitting in the pews. If I'm only going to share the gospel with people that have already heard it before, then I'm merely telling you good news once again that you've already heard. Now that would in itself be really great. Yes, you see, I don't want to be the only person preaching in this church. I would like to come here and preach, and I would like to share the gospel with you. But when I share the gospel with you, much like the children's story this morning, I would hope that it would make you laugh. Sometimes I hope that it makes you cry. Sometimes I hope that it inspires your heart to do things that you would have never done before. And one of those things I'd like to ask all of you to do, are you ready for it? I would like to ask you that as the live stream is uploaded to the Facebook and the YouTube, that you go to Facebook and you hit the share button on Facebook and that you go to YouTube and that you subscribe to the Pendleton Adventist Church YouTube page and that you share the videos and here's why friends we have plenty of people in this community that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ the reason they need to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ friends is because Jesus is the only name by which we can be saved and friends I was actually scrolling on Facebook this week and I saw something very troubling posted by an atheist this atheist man said, there's one thing that puzzles me about the Christians in today's world. He says, in the Bible that they read, that they believe is the very word of God, it says that all who believe on the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. He says, here's the thing that confuses me. Most of the Christians who sit in church every week and hear the gospel message never tell their neighbors. Huh. He says, Here's the thing that I've decided. The Bible says, Christians say that the Bible says that God is love. I've decided that the Christians just don't like their neighbors because if their neighbors knew the name of Jesus, then they could have eternal life too. This is coming from an atheist saying, I think that maybe Christians just don't like their neighbors because they're not excited to tell the world about Jesus. Here's the exciting thing though. I'm at the Pendleton Adventist Church in my first week here. My sermon was uploaded to YouTube and Facebook and it was shared maybe five or six times. In my second Sabbath here, it was shared 25 times 
and we had views in 20 plus countries around the world, comments, and I even got messages in the email, on the Facebook Messenger, from people in the community who are seeing the sermons and hearing the gospel message of God. Can we give God an applause? So friends, don't get me wrong. The sermon is titled today, Come and See, because I do want you to come. I want you to walk up those stairs, through that door, into this church. I want you to greet the greeters as they greet you and have smiles on your faces and songs in your heart. And I want to tell you why. Because friends, we do not come to church because we like the songs, because the pastor's entertaining, because the Sabbath schools are the best on planet Earth, which they are. I was down in Sabbath school this morning actually playing with Legos, and we were building Bible stories in Sabbath school, and it was a blast. We actually made uh, a goat for the sacrifice that had wheels for legs in the back, and, all, and, and it ended up being, let me just tell you the short version of the story, it ended up being a droid goat. It is the greatest goat that I have ever seen in my entire life. So we are having fun in Sabbath school. But I'm not inviting you to church for that. Let me break the news to you why we're coming to church. Friends, I don't want you to come to church hoping to be entertained. I want you to come to church for one reason. It's because in this church, in this sanctuary, we are praising a God who is worthy of praise. Can I get an amen for that? Why is he worthy for praise? Are you wondering that? Some of you might be today. I'm glad you're asking that question if you are because I'm about to tell you the reason he's worthy of praise is because in the beginning was the word. Oh, turn to your Bibles. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word. What does it say next in John chapter one? It says, in the beginning was the word and what? Somebody tell me. The word was, what? With God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. What happens next? Here we go. The word was with God and the word was God. Now, as I was listening to the children's story this morning, I was absolutely blown away because the scripture reading that I gave you has nothing to do with the word of God, or does it? Hmm. And the children's story this morning, we heard all of the similarities between a cat and your Bibles. Were you guys listening during that story? Yes. What I'm hoping it is is that the Bibles in your house have not collected so much dust that you have to pet them and then also, you know, try to flip the pages so that they will open and so that they purr. I'm hoping that that's not happening. But friends, let's go back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. It says in the New Living Translation, in the beginning the word already existed. That means before anything, the word already was. Then it says, the word was with God and the word was God. Oh, he existed in the beginning with God, verse 2. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Friends, do you get excited about your Bibles? Sometimes. Okay, even I have to admit that there have been many times when I have tried a little exercise on the new year. Raise your hand if you can agree with me. I know many of you ha can actually agree with me that you've had this experience. How many of you on New Year's Eve have said, this year, I'm going to read the entire Bible cover to cover in one year? How many of you have done it? Oh, please raise your hands with me. Come on. Confession is good for the soul. I'm confessing with you right now. Okay, I see many of you. You've decided I'm going to set out from Genesis all the way down to Revelation where God reaches out with his very own hand and wipes the tears from our eyes. I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover in one year. And everything goes great. Oh, yes, in the beginning, God created the world. Oh, this is exciting. He's speaking things into existence. This is great. And then we get to the part where he breathes into the dust of the earth, the very most worthless soil that you could possibly include in scripture. And suddenly man is created in his image. And then next, oh my, he creates a day, the Sabbath, so that he can actually draw close to us once every week, be with us. And it's a day that's sanctified and protected from the attacks of the devil. Oh, imagine that God built into eternity the Sabbath day, not just so that we would get together and serve and worship him, but because he wanted a day built into time so that he could keep his promise to you and I. What's his promise? Titus 1 verse 2, preached last week, going to say it again. You'll notice I go back to verses. 
Somebody once came up to me, they said, preacher, why do you keep preaching? Well, hello, young man. Are you having fun in church today? I'm really excited because I've got my nephews, my niece, my sister, and my brother-in-law, and my mom all sitting on the front row of church today. Is God good? Somebody came up to me and they said, Pastor, why do you keep preaching from the same passage of Scripture? You keep preaching the same sermon. I said, yes, I know. I've been waiting for the congregation to start living by what I've been preaching. <laughs> and when they do, I'll think that they heard it. Okay, I'm sorry. That was a little cheeky. I admit it. Sometimes I'm a pastor that throws punches. Punches because it says if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And parents love that verse. But it also says that God chastens those that he loves. Ah, yes, friends, I don't care if you're one years old sitting here today. I don't care if you're five, six, seven, eight, thirteen, or 99. You're still one of God's children. And so when you're quoting those verses, remember that if God loves you, he will rebuke you. Okay, so let's go back to the verse that I'm talking about that I actually proclaimed to you in the first sermon, second sermon, and now I'm proclaiming it to you again in the third sermon. Ah, here we go. It's found in the book of Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, and it says there... God, who cannot lie, promised you before eternity began. Now, why is that important in what I'm sharing with you on the Sabbath right now? It's important because God weaved into the fabric of his government, not one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, or six days, but instead he actually created a day. Interesting. He created a day that he hallowed, meaning God draw close to us, and he sanctified, meaning that he actually created a day that protects mankind from the dominion of Satan. Why would he do that? Why would he do that, friends? He did it be because before he created the world, he promised us eternal life. And he knew that if mankind decided in the Garden of Eden to go grab the apple and eat it and give Satan dominion over the entire world, that he would need a day in the week, where he actually had woven into the fabric of his government the ability to move even when we're not praying. God cares about us so much and loves us so much that he created a day and a week where he would have the ability to move on earth even if every single person on the planet decided to turn their hearts over to the enemy, that he would still have the ability to draw close to us, that he would still have the right within his government that he created to move close to us, to reconcile us so that we could all, as the children's story mentioned, become sons and daughters, royalty, the God of the universe. So in John chapter 1, we find that the word of God already existed and that the word was with God and that the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through Jesus the word, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created. Friends, this is exciting that the word of God gives life to everything that is created. Now, I want you to think about this. In the United States of America, most of us have up to three Bibles sitting in our house, and contained in these pages are the promises that lead to eternal life. Promises that when we pray and we claim them, God is actually allowed to move on our house, not on just on Saturday, but on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You see, friends, Jesus kept telling his disciples, pray, would you pray for me? And even in the moment of his temptation when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane getting ready to go to Calvary's tree for you and I, Jesus kept going to his disciples and saying, will you pray with me? Will you pray with me? Will you please stay awake and pray with me? Why do you think Jesus was doing that? Why do you think Jesus was doing that? It's because Jesus came into the world to give his life so that we can live. Oh, we're going to go a little bit further into the story, but first I want to highlight something else in your bulletins. Friends, I want you to spread the word. Not only do I want you to come to church every week and hear the sermon, and when you go home, I want you to share it so that all of the people in our community and all of the people around the world that will see it as a result of you sharing it can hear the gospel. But I also want you to join me in doing something else. Yes, I have planned an event for this church. Uh, you know, the Lord told me, Stephen, just do it and ask for forgiveness later. So here we go. <laughs> yeah, 
Okay, so I'm asking your forgiveness now, and Lynn, I just want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit's been moving in this sanctuary because when you came up and gave your prayer, you even pleaded with the congregation before I got up and preached and told them that I planned an event without their permission to forgive me. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for working that into the prayer. I was standing in the back thinking, Lord, how am I going to go out there and break it to them that I'm just planning church events without asking? And, and then Lynn told you that you should forgive your pastor if he plans something for you that will lead to your eternal life and said the prayer, amen. Yes, and I, I want to thank you for that. And then amazingly also, the Holy Spirit was moving in our sanctuary because during the children's story, during the children's story, listen, I didn't call you this week, did I? No, I didn't call you this week. I did not tell him what I was going to be preaching on. And nowhere in our scripture reading does it give the idea that I'm going to be talking about the importance of reading God's word. However, within the elements of this service, we already see the Holy Spirit working a miracle right here in this sanctuary by bringing together our service and the elements, by causing each and every single person that was a part of the service today to actually say and do things that would actually point to and highlight the opening of God's word in church. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Yes, today, friends, we've been in church witnessing a miracle, and I want to tell you something. In John chapter 14, it actually tells us that at the end of time, in the final moments of earth's history, John chapter 14 and verse 12 tells us Words from Jesus himself. It says, oh, he tells us the truth. Is it good news that Jesus tells us the truth? Yes. It says here, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me, what will happen? We'll do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Is this good news? He says, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. So the Son can bring glory to the Father. You ask for anything in my name. And I will do it. Now, some of you say, well, I've prayed prayers and God didn't answer him. How do you know that? How do you know he didn't answer him? First of all, we were actually sitting in the Sabbath school this morning. The Holy Spirit was moving in our Sabbath school. Can I get an amen for coming to Sabbath school and letting the Holy Spirit move through the opening of the word? I love to hear it as the teacher's teaching and people raise their hand and they say, but teacher, the word of God says this. Oh, yeah. And then the teacher goes, oh, yeah, let's, let's go there. Let's talk about that. Because in those meetings, as we're actually opening God's word and allowing him to speak to us, the Holy Spirit is moving right here in this sanctuary and giving us the instructions that lead us to a relationship with Jesus that leads to our eternal life. And that, my friends, is good news. But what I want to highlight here is this. It says, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Here's the good thing about God. Some of us say, well, you know, I prayed for a loved one to get well, but they went to sleep, and, and God didn't do it. Yeah, but friends, God has eternity to answer your prayer. He's not out of time. He will never run out of time. God existed before time began. God invented time, and when he comes again, I've got news for you. We're going to spend eternity with him. And in eternity, there are many prayers that you prayed in this life and felt disappointment that you will actually see those prayers answered. You know how I know it's true? Because Jesus can't lie because Jesus is God. We'll get there. It says next, Jesus promises us the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, listen to this. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Is it good news that our advocate never leaves us? Now, does it say it, it, it leaves us if we do something that God doesn't like? No. He says, I'm going to give you an advocate that what? Never will leave you. We'll keep pleading with you. We'll keep drawing close to you. We'll always keep chasing you because I serve a God who gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish and have everlasting life, not when everybody had their ducks in a row, but when his people were actually the ones leading him to the authorities to nail him to the cross. Do you understand the picture, friends? God did not come to save perfect people. God does not come to love perfect people. God does not even come only to love people that believe in him and are obeying his commandments. No, he's sending us a Holy Spirit that wants to draw near to us, an advocate that will never leave us. That's good news. Let's keep going. It says here, it says, he is the Holy Spirit who leads people into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will actually live in you. Ooh, this is getting exciting. I got to keep reading. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. And since I live, you will also live. Is that good news? Oh, 
When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Friends, do you know how God reveals himself to people in this world? Yes, through us. And how does he accomplish revealing himself to people that are living in this world through us? How does God empower us to preach the gospel of the kingdom into all of the world when we're facing a world like the one we're living in now? Friends, I have actually, without your permission, decided to create an event called the 40 Days of Prayer. And you have it right here in your building. Something exciting is coming to the Pendleton and Pilot Rock Church District on July 23rd. Pastor Farr and Pastor Dennis Smith, author of the 40 Days of Prayers and Devotions to Prepare for the Second Coming. Do we want to get ready for heaven? Okay, the author of 40 Days of Prayers and Devotions to Prepare for the Second Coming is going to join me. We're going to join forces to kick off 40 Days of Prayer at the Pendleton Adventist Church. The event's going to start at 6.30 p.m. Stay tuned for more details to come. And friends, you will also notice in your bulletin that I actually had written to my secretary that I not only wanted to ask for people 8 to 10 who are willing to lead small groups that are going to be a part of the 40 days of prayer, but I also put in the bulletin that I needed to raise donations so that I could afford the books. Now everybody's like, oh no, we have a new pastor, and in his third sermon, he's already asking for money. Well, I've got good news for you. I'm not asking for money, and here's why. I was sitting in my office, and I realized that I had no idea whether or not I had any money in this church for local evangelism or to purchase the resources. So, Our lovely church treasurer actually scheduled an appointment with me and came down. And before she got there, I was sitting in my office praying. I spent like five to ten minutes. God, I know we need to do a 40 days of prayer in this church because I know God's people need to be filled with your Holy Spirit so that we can be your hands and feet and take the gospel of the world and get really excited about reading our Bible so they're a lot less like cats and a lot more like swords. Are we ready for our Bibles to be a lot less like cats and a lot more like swords? Are we ready for our Bibles to not only change our lives, but use us to change other people's lives? I hope so. So I'm sitting in my office and I'm praying and I'm like, God, we need money. We really need it. The reason we need it, God, is because I need these books that will help equip this church to not only start a prayer, a prayer movement which will spark revival in the church, but will also help us to start small groups and get people excited about opening your Bible, not just when they come to church on Sabbath, if they come to Sabbath school but also maybe to join in small groups during the week, praying for each other, asking for your Holy Spirit to be poured out and opening the Bible of God and talking about it. Oh God, we really need it. Could you please do it? And the next thing you know, a knock comes on my office door. I'm like, oh, in the middle of prayer time, go over and open my office door. There is my church treasurer. She comes in and sits down and I said, listen, I I know we're gonna talk about the budget and go over everything, but first, right up front, I have to ask you a question. Do we have any money? Uh, (laughs) All right. Pause for that. Do we have any money? Why that? Money for what? Oh, yeah, sorry. I forgot. I've been praying about it for 10 minutes. You just got here. Let me catch you up. (laughs) We really need to do an event. First of all, I never asked the church permission to do the event, and I'm doing it anyway. She goes, oh. (laughs) And as a second of all, it's going to cost money, and that's not good news. We don't even have a church board at the end of the month, but I got to get rolling on this now. (laughs) And she's like, okay, I've heard this before. (laughs) Every pastor, all right, okay. So, and then I was like, okay, but here's the thing. What we need is resources. We need like 100 to 200 of these books so that every single member of this church can have not just one copy of the book, but two copies of the book so that they can go through the book and find a prayer partner, invite them to a small group, a small group leaders, and I'm going, and she goes, hold on a minute, stop. You're going a million miles an hour. Yes, I am. I am going a million miles an hour. Okay, I'll slow down. She says, hold on. She says, I just wanted to get a word in edgewise here and tell you something. Some of you like my sense of humor. All right. Other people are like, I'm still trying to catch up. (laughs) And I'm trying to catch up too. It's all right. (laughs) Is it Saturday? Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. Tracy. (laughs) All right. So she looks at me and she says, Stephen, I've got good news for you. We have a line in this church in our budget called the library fund. It's for literature and we have $1,080 in it. I think if you ask the church board really nicely, they might let you use it to buy books to start a prayer revival. I said, that's great news. 
And I was so happy and excited. What I didn't tell her was is I needed more than $1,080. <laughs> I didn't tell her that. I didn't want to disappoint her. I mean, she had just told me, I will vouch for you that I think we should probably use this and have a prayer revival. I think that our church could use it. I think the church down the road, in fact, probably every church in this entire town and in the world could use it. So I think this is a great idea. So anyway, she leaves my office, and then I bow my head and start praying again because I realized that I needed about $930 more dollars. And friends, I was praying for about five minutes when all of a sudden my watch on my wrist startled me. You see, I had my phone silenced because I don't like it ringing in the middle of appointments, but I do have a watch that actually buzzes so I can see who's calling in case it's an emergency so I can glance at it real quick. And if it's an emergency, I gotta step out and answer it. And the phone is ringing and it's a friend of mine from Walla Walla University that I haven't talked to in a long time. And I was like, okay, why is this person calling me in the middle of prayer? I guess I'll answer it. So I flip open the phone and answer it. Well, I didn't flip it open. I hit the button. <laughs> you can tell how old I am. But anyway, so I get on the phone and he says, Stephen, I am so excited that you're in the Pacific Northwest and I have just been spending some time in God's word in prayer and God impressed me to call you. And I said, oh, that's great. And he says, yeah. And also God impressed me to call you and ask you, um, I've got $1,000 here that I'd like to donate to your church. And I don't, yeah. <laughs> he says, I've got $1,000 right here that I would like to donate to your church because I know that when you go to this church, you're probably going to plan events that you didn't ask anyone anything about that you're going to need money for. <laughs> My reputation precedes me. <laughs> I'm like, God, forgive me. But anyway, so he says, uh, what budget line do I put it on? And I was like, well, I don't know if we should stick it in the library fund. So then I call my treasurer, and she didn't answer the phone, and I leave her this urgent message. I said, listen, I really need you to call me back at the earliest convenience. I've got this problem. i got somebody that wants to give us $1,000, and I don't know where to put it. And friends, it wasn't before the end of the day that my treasurer called me back. Can we get an amen for our treasurer? <laughs> she says, someone wants to donate money. Let me help you. <laughs> I love your spirit. Thank you. <laughs> and she says, I said, where do they donate it so that we can use it for more of the books? And she says, well, I think local evangelism is a great place to start. And I was like, we have a local evangelism budget line? That's great news. <laughs> so friends, I'm really excited to tell you that I have already actually raised $80 and 40 more cents than what I need. Plus, I've got emails coming in in the middle of the night where people are saying, I want to donate money and I want to be a part of this. I want to make it happen too. Do you think God's moving in the Pendleton Avenue Church? Amen. God is moving. Friends, when you can get stuff fun before you can even get the bulletin printed to ask people for money and you already have it all, you know God is up to something. My, my, my. So friends, I want you to be excited about that. Mark it on your calendars. It is a Friday night at 6.30, July 23rd. It's in your bulletin. July 23rd, Pastor Farr and Pastor Dennis Smith will be joining us via Zoom, the author of the book. We will spend some time here together in the sanctuary. I will ask very nicely our deaconesses to maybe bring some food at 6.30 so that, uh, you know, I can bribe you. But it is a Friday night, friends, and I want you all to come out, each and every single one of you, even those of you who are watching on Facebook and YouTube that are sitting at home right now, yes, on this Friday night at 6.30, July 23rd, I need everybody to come out to this church because I'm going to have several hundred copies of this book and they are going to have your names on it. And I'm going to need you. I'm going to need 10 people in this church that are willing to step up and be leaders for small groups because not only are each of you going to have the opportunity to have the resources for Two prayer partners, or pr you will be a prayer leader and you will have a prayer partner. So every person in this church is going to have it. Now, I will say this. You can choose someone in the church to pray with, okay? If I were really being hard on you, I would say that every single person has to go find someone that they don't know and they have to ask them to do the prayer thing. For this year, for the first time, you can all choose someone in the church. But what I would like all of you to do is, is you're going to get two copies of this book and you're going to join forces together for 40 days. Now, here's the beautiful thing. All of you are thinking, how do we have time to do 40 days of praying? The good news is, is you don't pray from the first thing when you wake up until you go to bed. So I'm not asking for like 24 hours of prayer every day. But what I am asking for is, is that you would each read the daily devotional. There's 40 of them in the books individually. And that you would spend 15 minutes with your prayer partners each day discussing the book and praying together. And also, each and every single book, this is the exciting thing about these books, they are made for people who are incredibly busy. In these books, there's actually prayer cards. Let me show you the book. 
There are prayer cards inside the book. And get this, there's a prayer card in the front of the book for your prayer partner, and there is five prayer cards in the back of the book for the five people that you individually are going to choose to pray for with your prayer partner. You know what that means? If 200 people in this church decide to pray, we will be praying for 2,000 people collectively. Amen. Okay, so uh, these prayer cards are amazing because you can actually literally open your book and the prayer card has room for the name, phone number, email, address of the person you're praying for, the prayer requests that they want to pray for. It even has a check mark thing that you can check each day that you pray for them so that you know that you prayed for them for 40 days. Isn't that amazing? It's all there for you. You don't even have to like create it yourself. And then also, here's something that I really love. Besides praying for people, friends, the word of God makes us the hands and feet of Jesus. And I can promise you what's going to happen as you're going through this 40 days of prayer. God is going to inspire you with activities of caring and service that you can do for the people that you're praying for. And as he inspires you in your time of prayer, you can write those down and then you can ask God to show you how he wants to use you to begin to go out in our community and to share the love of God with the people that you're praying for. Okay, now, some of you are wondering, but Pastor Farr, are you actually going to preach the passage that's in the bulletin for church today? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to get to that right now. Okay, so friends, what we are going to actually have, the fan is blowing, which is really nice because it stays cool up here, but my notes just keep flying. So we're just going to set them aside and preach. All right, here we go. Uh, John chapter 1, let's go back there in our Bibles. John chapter 1, we find the passage, your scripture reading for today. And I would like to go through this passage with you shortly and share with you the thoughts that God placed on my heart as I read it. So in John chapter 1, and zooming all the way down, I'm throwing stuff around here too. Where do we start? Verse 43 through verse 46. All right, here we go. John chapter 1. 43, it starts, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew, and Peter's hometown. Immediately, Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? I thank you for the way you read that. I, I loved right where you stopped. It was beautiful. And then he says to him, come and see for yourself. Philip replied, as they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. Ooh, Jesus is paying him a compliment. Or is he? How do you know about me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the son of man the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Let's start there. What does that mean that angels are going to go up and down from heaven on Jesus like he's a stairway between heaven and earth? What is he talking about? And is this just going to automatically happen? Is this happening all the time, day and night? Well, probably because I know somewhere somebody's praying. Friends, did you know that Christ Object Lesson says that there are thousands upon ten thousands of angels up in heaven waiting at Christ's right hand as he sits on the throne, waiting to be commissioned on behalf on the wings of our prayers to create room for God to work in this world on behalf of the people that we are praying for. And here's the thing the angels are wondering. Why, if the people of God have been promised by Jesus the power of the Holy Spirit and all of the angels of heaven at their disposal if they will just pray. Why are they not praying? Why? 
Why, if on our prayers, God would actually have permission to send his angels on that stairway that he is between heaven and earth? Oh, yes, he laid down his life, not just to forgive us of our sins, but so that he would actually have the ability and the authority and the power to draw close to the world through the power of his Holy Spirit and the angels that he can send on our behalf to push back the forces of darkness that are trying to gain the minds and hearts of each and every single one of us so that God can move and work in our lives. Friends, do you want to be a part of praying for the thousands upon ten thousands of angels that are in heaven to come down here and begin to cause God's kingdom to be built on earth as it is in heaven? Do you want to be part of that? I would like you to join me in doing it. And you can do it by joining me when? On July at where you're going to get two copies of the book so that you can get a prayer partner and start praying because, friends, we're going to see the power of the Holy Spirit poured out in this church. And not only is the power of the Holy Spirit going to lead each and every single one of us into truth, but it's going to lead us into unity. Yes, that Holy Spirit is going to lead us into unity. It's going to bring us together. That person of the Holy Spirit is going to be present like never before. The angels of God are going to be coming down, and the angels of God are going to be sent on the wings of our prayers for the people we're praying for. Is that good news? All right, let's go back to the top of the passage. Here we are. In verse 43, then next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he immediately found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Now, why do you suppose Jesus said, come follow me? Why did he want Philip to follow him? He wants all of us to follow him because Jesus is our teacher. Ah, And when we follow Jesus and we spend time with him, as our children's story said today, when we spend time with the word that was in the beginning became flesh, dwelt among men, sitting on the throne in heaven right now. When we spend time in the word of God, then we begin to be instructed by Jesus about what God wants to say to us as individuals. Isn't that exciting? So Jesus says, he says, come and follow me. Then Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. And what does Philip do? Check this out. Philip went immediately to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. Friends, I want every single person in my entire church to be a Nathaniel. Because the minute Jesus came to him and said, hey, you, come and follow me. Nathaniel looked at him and he said, he was super excited. Anyone have an idea why he was so excited when Jesus said, come and follow me? Wasn't he just another teacher in Israel? I mean, there were plenty of teachers in Israel, right? Ah, look at the story in the context. Friends, John the Baptist had actually been calling people to come and what? Repent. And be baptized. It was a voice crying in the wilderness. Pendleton's a little bit like a wilderness, isn't it? It's kind of hot out here right now. All of us feel like we need about six times the amount of water that we normally intake. But friends, there was a voice crying in the wilderness saying, come, repent, make straight the pathway for the Lord. What do you think he was talking about? What do they mean? Make straight a pathway. I'll tell you what it means. Friends, God is calling each and every single one of us that are a part of the Pentland Adventist Church, and not only that, he's actually calling all of the people in the world through his people right now, just like Nathaniel when he was called, come and follow me. He went immediately went and got someone else. He's actually calling us to come to him to be repent and be baptized by water. Why? To make straight the path for the Holy Spirit to come into your life. And so Nathaniel is one of the greatest church members of all time because the minute Jesus came to him and said, come follow me, he went immediately to find one of his friends. Yes, it says Philip went and looked for Nathaniel and told him. I'm sorry, I want everyone to be a Philip. (laughs) When are you guys going to correct me on that? Somebody tell me. Friends, do not take my word for everything that I say. Open your Bibles and read it because the preacher's not always right. Sometimes you need to come and tell me, hey, uh, you said that everyone needs to be a Nathaniel. I think you want him to be a Philip. Okay, here we go. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Now, as I came here to Pendleton and Pilot Rock, I have to confess to you, I was telling Craig on the front row, I was like, I don't know if I should actually say this, but... There has been some people that have come to me and they're like, listen, it just seems like one thing after another has been happening in Pendleton. Can any good thing happen in Pendleton? (laughs) And as I was reading this passage, I was like, I don't know. Like, I mean, I kind of feel like people have been saying that to me. I don't know if I make that comparison, but here's the good news. I got good news for you based on the passage. I got good news for you. Because... The person that was actually saying, can any good thing come out of Nazareth, 
was biased against Nazareth because he lived in a neighboring town that didn't like the people in Nazareth. Hmm. And so, listen to this. Come and see for yourself, Philip replies. Okay. So as they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. Was Jesus paying him a compliment? No. He was not paying him a compliment. Now, he did know that he was a good man who was actually under a fig tree praying and that he did worship God. Okay, so in that sense, it was a compliment. But the reason why he called him a good Israelite and a man of total integrity is because he was honest about his unbelief and his biases against other people. And so, friends, this is what's really interesting about Nathaniel. He was an honest man who was trying to be a good Israelite and follow God. But he was a man who was already repenting of his unbelief and his bias about people who did not agree with his opinions that he didn't like. Hmm. So Jesus says to him, now, here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. And then he goes on, how do you know about me, Nathanael asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Here's the amazing thing about this. When, when Nathanael actually called Jesus Rabbi, what does that word mean? In that moment, he was saying, you're my teacher. <laughs> and you know why you're my teacher? Because you know everything about me before you even met me. Friends, I want to tell you something about Jesus. He knows each and every single detail of your life long before you make the decision to call him teacher, to agree to follow him, to follow the things that he says. He's pursuing you. He's chasing you. He's coming after you with extravagant, unconditional love, and he's not going to stop until he wins your heart. Then the story ends. It says, then Nathaniel exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe that just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You see greater things than this. You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down. The son of man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth, will be the one making it possible for angels and the Holy Spirit to be poured out in your world on behalf of your prayers. Friends, will you join me in praying? You know, I love this passage of scripture because it says, come and see. Come and see what? Well, at the beginning, we heard a children's story talking about the word of God. One of my favorite passages in the entire Bible on the word of God is Hebrews. Is it 4 verse 12 or 12 verse 4? Just came to my mind now. Turn there in your Bibles. I just want to share this with you. Hebrews 4 verse 12. Hebrews 4 verse 12. It says here, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. Friends, I want to tell you something about the Bible that I'm holding in my hand right now. This word of God is alive. It is the word that was in the beginning and became flesh and dwelt among men. Yes, this is the words of God, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, this word can actually, with the, the spirit of the influence of the spirit, can lead you into all truth. It can help you to discover the promises of God, but more than that, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, as we behold him. How do we come and see? The, the, the appeal was, come and see. They said, Jesus, where do you live? He says, come and see. Nathaniel says, oh, just come and see for yourself. Come and see, come and see. The one that we've been waiting for all of our lives has come the one who's going to bring eternal life, the one whose words can actually give us eternal life, the one who laid down his life for you and me so that we can live the life we're living right now, but more than that, so that we can have eternal life through him. Oh, come and see. Friends, I want to tell you something. In the weeks to come, I'm going to be preaching on prayer. I went to a men's conference with my grandfather. They had a bunch of frames up in the front of the room. If you went to every single meeting, you could win one. There was one with an eagle on it that had Isaiah 41, verse 31. I wanted it so bad, and I was praying to win. And guess what happened? I didn't win. Ah! Dang it, I prayed, and it didn't work. And this, this church thing's not working out for me. I sat here and prayed. I wanted the picture frame. Didn't get it. And then all of a sudden, as I'm sitting there, not only did I not win, but my grandfather won. Oh, I was disappointed. They drew his number. He says, yes, he gets up. 
And he goes to the table, and there on the table, there's two picture frames left, the one that I really want bad, and the one that I'm like, why would anyone want that? <laughs> like, I was like, I don't even know why they put it up there. That's just ridiculous. Nobody would want that picture frame. And guess which one my grandfather picked? The one that nobody would want. Ah, Grandpa, you had one job. You could have got it for me. So I'm sitting there pouting. I was literally pouting, a full-grown man pouting. It was happening. I'm sitting there, oh. If it would have been me, I'd have got the right one. And now that my grandfather, bless his soul, has been laid to rest, and I've had this sitting in my office for so many years that it's actually broken, and there's like glass in the back, so nobody come and handle this, okay? I might show it to you on the way, just don't touch it. It's, it's broken. It's fine. It's a beautiful picture of hands. And in the weeks to come, we're going to go into the book of Acts. Oh, I don't want you to miss it. We are going to be going into the book of Acts, and we're going to be talking about the greatest prayer revival that ever hit planet Earth so that I can whet your appetite for what happens when we get together and pray. But here it says, teamwork, and it has a bunch of hands in the middle. Everybody's hands in, holding hands together. It says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Friends, I've got news for you. The Pendleton and Pilot Rock Church District is about to put their hands in the middle and come together in prayer. And when we do, oh yes, this small group of people that have had many different disappointments happen to this town. One of them was when the Harris Pine Mill shut down many years ago. Big disappointment. Yeah, we've been going through trials. We've had the COVID-19, so has the whole world. Friends, I got news for you. You know what? Pendleton's a lot like Nazareth. But Pendleton's also a lot like all of the towns and cities around the world right now that are in need of a Savior. My appeal to you is that you'll come back and you'll see and that you'll share this gospel message, that you'll get on YouTube, that you'll get on Facebook and you'll share the sermons, that you'll invite friends to join you in small groups for prayer once a week. You'll actually be praying every day. You're only going to have to attend a small group five times and then you don't have to go anymore unless you want to keep going, okay? And this is the really beautiful thing about it. You're actually going to be praying with your prayer partner every day and then you're going to be meeting with a group of people once a week. Why are you going to meet with a group of people once a week? Let me tell you. You're going to meet with a group of people once a week because you're going to have testimonies to share. Oh, and it's going to be excited because God's going to be answering your prayers. Miracles are going to be happening. And as you share those testimonies and you actually watch the word of God that is alive, that is moving, that is changing, that is the center of thoughts, it's cutting to the center of the bone and the marrow, and even knows the very intents of your heart, as you actually see that what's in this Bible is true, you are going to get so excited and on fire for God that you're going to want to go out and tell all of your neighbors, friends, come and see. The one, the one, the one who can take us to heaven is here. Oh, come and see. Jesus is alive. He's sitting on the throne. Come and see. Miracles are happening. In the Pendleton and Pilot Rock Church, oh, you all had a bias. You thought to yourselves, nothing good has ever happened. Nothing good ever will. Friends, something good is coming to Pendleton and Pilot Rock. And I've got news for you. This is going to be a center of evangelism. And from this place in this building, we're going to share the name of Jesus with people all over the earth. And when we're done, oh yes. And then I got a song I'd like to sing for you in closing today. I have to ask for your forgiveness at this very moment. Not only did I plan an event that you didn't ask me to plan, which I'm begging you to be a part of, but I preached till almost 20 past noon. Ah, oh. and after this, we're going to have potluck, I do believe. Okay. Friends, I got a song for you today. Please listen to the words. You're actually going to see the words on the screen. This is not a performance. I am not singing this song today because I'm the greatest singer in the world. I'm singing this song today because the words of this song are true for each and every single person sitting in this church. It's true for every single person listening on Facebook and YouTube. So as I sing this song, as Doris and I together work to bring you the words of God's word, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to bless each and every single one of you. Here we go. To all who are tortured and ravaged by sin, the frail and the wounded about to give in, there's news of release and captivity's end. We've been set free, come and see. Oh, sleeper, awake, come out of the night. Throw open the door and step into the light. 
for sin is undone and the wrong is made right. We've been set free, come and sin. Come and see the power of sin has been broken. The gates of your prison stand open. Come and see. Arise, be there. For the power that once spoke to rescue and save is the power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave. You've been set free. Come and see. I too lived in slavery, unmercifully bound, battered and broken. At last I knelt down, and there in surrender, obedience found. I've been set free, and now through the darkness of dungeons I roam. I run in the freedom of liberty's light and shout to the captives, oh prisoner, take flight. We've been set free, come and sing. Come and see the power of sin has been broken. The gates of your prison stand open. Come and see. Arise, be there. For the power at work, both to rescue and save, is the power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave. We've been set free. If the enemy's holding a knife to your chest, demanding you give in and die, in Christ crucified, you've already died, and now you are free. Come and see, the power of sin has been broken. The gates of your prison stand open, come and see. Arise, be there, for the power at work both to rescue and save is the power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave. We've been set free. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, This means that anyone who's come to Jesus, oh, the old life of sin that he lived has been passed away. Behold, all things are new. Come and see. Jesus is alive.